Hello again, Dr. Nick Taylor, emergency physician. Welcome back to Time Critical Medical Education. Fantastic tutorial coming up on a very common, very dangerous topic, hyperkalemia. In order to understand how to successfully diagnose and treat hyperkalemia, we do need to go a little bit into the pathophysiology. 95% of total body potassium is found in cells and only 5% is extracellular, leading to a concentration of about 4 to 4.5 milliequivalents per litre in the serum. Almost all the potassium is handled by the kidneys, so about 90 to 95% is excreted by the kidneys, only 5 to 10% comes out in your poo. Potassium is really important for cardiac function. The reason for this is because it makes up a significant amount of the effect causing the resting membrane potential. We all know that the NAK ATPase pump pumps potassium back into the cell against its concentration gradient and pumps sodium out of the cell. The other thing that's very important to know is that phase naught of the action potential is rapid sodium channel opening. Now, the number of sodium channels or the percentage that open is proportional to the value of the resting membrane potential. Okay, so here's where potassium plays its role. In the setting of hyperkalemia, the resting membrane potential becomes more positive. So instead of being minus 90 millivolts, in hyperkalemia, it might be minus 80, or when it's severe, minus 70 millivolts. This then has the effect of reducing the Vmax. Now remember the Vmax was related to the number of sodium channels opening. If the Vmax is low, then depolarization will take longer. A slower depolarization will lead to widening of the QRS. So not only does hyperkalemia affect the resting membrane potential, but it also does affect the threshold potential. However, it doesn't change the threshold potential by as much as it does the RMP. So if the RMP is now minus 80, the threshold potential might go from minus 75 millivolts to minus 70 millivolts. So that means there's only now a 10 millivolt difference between them. So it's supposed to be 15. So when you have less difference between resting and threshold, you have a more excitable cardiac membrane. So in the setting of early hyperkalemia, you'll get increased excitability. Now, as the hyperkalemia gets more severe, the effect of the decreasing Vmax and slowing of depolarization tends to overwhelm this increase in excitability. The final place that hyperkalemia affects the action potential is during repolarization. But looking back at our action potential, we can see that potassium efflux is starting to occur in phase 2 and phase 3. So the plateau phase, phase 2, happens when calcium is entering the cell and potassium is leaving the cell, and these two effects balance out so there's no net change in membrane potential. During phase 3, Calcium channels now close and potassium is now leaving the cell. Now, for reasons that aren't well understood, the currents in these IKR potassium channels are actually sensitive to the extracellular potassium level. So weirdly, when ECF potassium goes up, more potassium leaves the cell due to these channels being more active. This has the effect of changing the slope and shortening repolarization time. Okay, let's summarize the effect of hyperkalemia on the action potential by looking at this diagram. The red line is the action potential. We're going to have a higher resting membrane potential and smaller difference between RMP and threshold. We're going to have a slower Vmax leading to longer depolarization in phase naught. We're going to have a shorter plateau phase two and we're going to have a steeper phase three repolarization. And if we have a look at the effect that's going to do on the ECG, the purple line, that's going to lead to broader QRS, shorter QT, and tall, narrow T waves. All that good electrophysiology did have a point because learning about the action potential effects allows us to diagnose hyperkalemia early on the ECG. One of the earliest signs of hyperkalemia 
are peaked T waves. I am going to stress, peak T waves is what everyone says when you ask them what is the sign of hyperkalemia. In some studies though, it does only occur in about 25% of ECGs. For the T waves to be peaked, they do have to have a narrow base as well. So a big, fat, broad T wave is not the T wave of hyperkalemia. And if you remember why, it's because the shortening of repolarization occurs and that leads to a narrow T wave. There are lots of other features of hyperkalemia, so let's have a look at those. Usually the next thing you'll see on the ECG is decreased P wave amplitude and increased PR interval. This is due to the fact that the atria is more sensitive to the effects of hyperkalemia than the nodal tissue and the ventricles. So as the potassium level goes up, the P wave size will decrease until the P waves become completely absent. As we already discussed, the slowing of the Vmax with the sodium channels means that the depolarization time in ventricular myocardium is going to increase. So you are going to start seeing wide QRS at around the same time that you're going to start seeing the reduction in those P waves, etc. As the hyperkalemia gets worse, the QRS will widen further. This widening of the QRS leads to one of the classic sources of confusion about VT and hyper-K. Hyperkalemia rarely causes VT, it causes VF, and it causes this rhythm, the sinoventricular rhythm. The sinoventricular rhythm happens because the atria is very sensitive to hyperkalemia, as discussed, and the P waves aren't visible. Now the sinoatrial node and the AV node are much more resistant to hyperkalemia, so they keep firing off. We get a rhythm that's generated in the sinus node, there's no signs of that because there's no atrial depolarization wave, and the signal makes it to the ventricle where its depolarization is slowed down, giving you a wide QRS. So what you get is a no P wave, wide QRS rhythm that looks a bit like VT. The big differentiation here is, one, it's not a monomorphic pattern like you'd expect in VT, and two, it's not fast enough. Classically in hyperkalemia, the rate of the sinoventricular rhythm is between about 80 and 110. VT needs to be 110 to about 180. The rhythm that we see on the screen here has a rate of about 100. Please, please don't try and defibrillate a sinoventricular rhythm. It's not going to work. You need to treat the hyperkalemia. And one of the other really cool things that happens in hyperkalemia is that profound problems you get with repolarization can actually induce ST segment elevation and cause a pseudo-infarction pattern. So hyperkalemia, you can add it to your list of ischemia mimics. Stephen Smith's ECG blog has got a couple of great examples of pseudo-infarction in hyperkalemia. Finally, as the potassium level increases, and it's often more than 8, um, often up to 9 or 10, you get a complete absence of a normal looking QRS complex as it widens right out and becomes what's known as a sine wave pattern. It is important to remember that the rate of change of the potassium is very important for the ECG changes. So someone who had a normal potassium yesterday and today has a potassium of 8 may have sine wave pattern. Someone with dialysis dependent chronic kidney failure might actually have potassium of 9 or 10 before they start progressing to a sine wave. Okay, so hopefully now you've got a better idea of what to expect on the ECG and you need to start thinking about treatment. In my view, if there are ECG changes secondary to hyperkalemia, the patient needs immediate treatment. It's really important that calcium is given first in patients with abnormal ECGs secondary to hyperkalemia. To understand why you should give it, you do need to understand about what calcium is doing to help stabilize the membrane, as they say. Remember we talked about that resting membrane potential dropping down to say minus 80, minus 75, and the threshold potential dropping down to say minus 70 so that the difference between them is much less than it should be. Well, first thing calcium does to stabilize the membrane is actually make that threshold potential change so what you're going to do, for example, is drop that threshold potential, say, from minus 75 down to minus 65, which restores the normal difference of minus 15 millivolts between resting and threshold. 
The second thing that giving calcium does is change the shape of the Vmax to RMP curve. Now remember we said the Vmax from the sodium channels has got lower as the resting membrane potential has gone up from minus 90 to minus 80 or minus 75. Well, when you give calcium, it actually changes the shape of that curve and shifts it upwards, which is the dotted line on this graph. So at lower resting membrane potentials, you actually get normalization of the Vmax which then reduces depolarization time and allows the heart to function much better. The final way that calcium helps is by directly increasing the Vmax to speed impulse propagation in those tissues, the AV node and the sinoatrial node, which have calcium dependent action potentials. When you give intravenous calcium, it works really fast, so within about a minute or two, but it only lasts about half an hour. So you do have to give repeat doses in patients who have severe hyperkalemia. Now, the most common thing that I see when people are treating hyperkalemia is they get the doses of calcium wrong. Look, the simplest way to think about this, for patients who are not in cardiac arrest, just give calcium gluconate. And usually one or two vials of 10 mils of 10% is enough. So... One gram of calcium gluconate salt is 2.3 millimoles, and that's contained in 10 mils of 10%. For someone in cardiac arrest, you need to have more calcium. So you could give calcium chloride in this situation. So in cardiac arrest, one gram of calcium chloride is 6.8 millimoles. That's still 10 mils of 10%. If you're going to give calcium gluconate in cardiac arrest, you probably should give two or three vials. So you're giving that higher dose of calcium. There's a long-standing myth that you shouldn't give calcium to patients with hyperkalemia secondary to digoxin toxicity because it will cause a stone heart. Look, the reality is this myth is based on a couple of dog studies a long time ago where the calcium levels were extremely high and there wasn't really a determination of the digoxin level. So not exactly fantastic evidence. Some case reports recently show it's likely to be safe my suggestion is that if a patient is dying because of hyperkalemia, give calcium regardless of cause. Now, obviously, DigiBind is going to be incredibly important in treating digoxin toxicity. So once we've given the calcium and started helping the heart to not just fall apart at the seams, we're going to try and hide potassium inside the cells to reduce the ECF concentration. And the best and easiest way to do that is by giving a combination of insulin and dextrose. You don't necessarily have to give dextrose or you don't necessarily have to give insulin. Someone's got a functioning pancreas. Usually you could give either and everything would be all right. But tradition and common sense dictates that in life-threatening hyperkalemia, you should probably just give both. In our place, what we do is we give 25 grams of dextrose. Now, dextrose at 25 grams is usually contained in 50% solution. That stuff is very toxic to veins, so I always stick that in a 100 ml bag of saline, so it's given at half of the concentration. So I start that running in, and then I give 10 units of IV act rapid insulin, so fast acting insulin. When you do this, you're going to expect a reduction of the potassium of about 0.5 to 1 ml equivalents per litre, and this is going to take probably a quarter of an hour or so. The next thing I give to people with life-threatening hyperkalemia is salbutamol. Why? Because it's very easy to give as a nebulizer whilst you're doing other things. So if you've only got one line available, you can start the calcium, you can give the insulin dextrose, but you can neb the patient with salbutamol. I just do back-to-back -back 5 milligram nebs, and then I repeat a blood gas, and I hope that the potassium is coming down. Some studies have found that salbutamol in high doses decreases potassium levels from about 0.5 to 1 milliequivalents a litre. Remember that in arrest, adrenaline is also a beta-2 agonist and will push potassium into the cell. The beta-2 effect on potassium actually outweighs the alpha effect, so the net effect is a reduction in potassium levels, so give adrenaline early in a hyperkalemic arrest. Oh, we're up to my friend bicarbonate, poor old misinformed bicarbonate. Unfortunately, although everyone loves to give bicarbonate for lots of indications, the only thing it really works for is sodium channel blocking drug overdose. Now, 
Unfortunately, the evidence for its use in hyperkalemia is also quite poor. Yes, I know it's supposed to induce an alkalosis and the hydrogen-potassium exchange means that potassium gets shoved into the cell. But the studies that have looked at this show that, one, the effect is minimal. Two, the effect takes a long time. Three, the effect is not sustained. The reality is, for an emergency patient with hyperkalemia, bicarbonate isn't really doing anything in a meaningful time frame. It is giving some patients an unnecessary volume load, and I think, personally, it distracts your helping staff from doing the things which are going to make a big difference. So whilst they're getting the bicarbonate drawn up and ready for infusion, they could be giving repeat dose of insulin dextrone or nebulizing the salbutamol or arranging the dialysis. So once you've hidden the potassium, it is important to try and get rid of it. Now, if the person does have functional kidneys, now not many of them do, but some of them do, it's really important to try and promote a diuresis. Now, for someone whose hyperkalemia is due to a crush injury, for example, this may well be just promotable with fluid loading with normal saline. For people who have got functional kidneys and having a bit of trouble getting started, then using some furizomide, which will waste a bit of potassium in the urine, is not a bad idea. Having said that, most patients that we see with profound hyperkalemia have profound renal failure. And for those patients, getting to dialysis as early as possible is extremely important. Of course, the patients in the ICU can have filtration CVVHDF if formal dialysis is not available. But for the renal patients, trying to get them to the dialysis ward as soon as they are cardiac stable is the most important thing you can do. So normally when I'd get to the bit about resins, I'd say, don't do it, don't give it, they don't work, they take a long time, the potential side effects, they've got no role in the management of acute hyperkalemia. So that would be true of calcium rhizonium or K-exalate. Now, there has been a number of trials recently for two new binding agents, one called Petirima and one called Zirconium Cyclosilicate or ZS9. Now, these drugs are actually being trialled for use in chronic hyperkalemic states like renal failure, and they have worked really well. But the interesting thing about these two drugs is they also seem to work much faster than the old binding resins did. So, watch this space. They're not formally approved yet, but it may be that these two new drugs have some small place in the acute management of hyperkalemia. Congratulations, you've finished the hyperkalemia tutorial. Remember that take-home messages are important. Hyperkalemia decreases cardiac Vmax, which prolongs depolarization, but it also shortens repolarization. Don't rely only on the peak T waves, please. There's far more signs you need to look for, including the sinoventricular rhythm, which mimics VT, but does not respond to cardioversion. You must give calcium. If the patient's unwell but not arrested, give one vial of calcium gluconate. If the patient's arrested, give three vials of gluconate or one vial of calcium chloride. Don't spend your time trying to give bicarb. It's not very useful in the emergent situation. And surprisingly, resins are probably coming back. Thank you so much for listening and watching this TICME tutorial on hyperkalemia. I read a fantastic article to help me with this talk, which was Parham et al.'s Hyperkalemia Revisited from the Texas Heart Institute Journal in 2006. Also for the management around the resins, I had a look at Covesti's Management of Hyperkalemia in the American Journal of Medicine from 2015. Remember, if there's any questions at all related to this talk, please write them in comments on www.tickme.com.au.